It was just past 11.15 at night when the ground near northeastern Japan unleashed a magnitude 7.6 jolt, so intense that even standing became impossible in cities along the Pacific coast. Within moments, lights swung, alarms wailed, and lives changed course as power grids faltered and bullet trains halted. But this shock wasn't finished. At the heart of the Pacific Ring of Fire, an urgent tsunami warning followed, forcing thousands to flee inland in the dead of night. What triggered this sudden chain reaction, and how far could the devastation reach? Cabinet doors slam open, plates and glasses hit the floor in a spray of glass. In a Hachinohe living room, a hanging light swings violently, casting wild shadows across the walls. The ground heaves so hard that a teenager, halfway to the door, stumbles and clings to a table as it slides away from him. Shelves rattle and books topple in a rush. In a corner shop, security cameras capture a cashier crouching behind the counter as bottles and snacks cascade from racks. The walls groan and ceiling tiles crack overhead. On the upper floors of an apartment block, the shaking grows even more intense. Shoes, picture frames, and electronics spill from ledges. A family huddles under a sturdy dining table, arms over their heads as the floor bucks beneath them. The noise is overwhelming. Glass shattering, alarms blaring, the deep roar of the earth itself. Across the city, it is nearly impossible to stand upright. Unsecured furniture crashes over. In hallways, fluorescent lights whip back and forth, flickering in and out. The air fills with dust shaken loose from ceilings and walls. For endless seconds, every ordinary room becomes a hazard zone. In these moments, the only warning is the violence of the shaking itself. The need to act is immediate. This is the reality of Shindo Upper Six. Nothing feels stable, and every second brings new danger. A single message cuts through the chaos. This magnitude 7.6 earthquake off Japan's northeastern coast is a clear reminder that the Japan Trench, part of the Pacific Ring of Fire, remains an active subduction zone, where even a magnitude 7 event can produce dangerous localized tsunamis and immediate community risk. Move to higher ground and follow official instructions. The threat is not over. Cracks slice across city streets, splitting fresh asphalt and buckling sidewalks in the cold night air. At intersections, traffic lights sway in wide, uneasy arcs, some blinking out as the power grid stumbles. Overhead, utility poles lean at odd angles, their lines snapping and sparking against the darkness. A transformer explodes near a railway crossing, sending a shower of blue-white light across empty lots. In the distance, alarms wail, and the steady hum of the city fades as entire neighborhoods lose electricity. Commuters stand stranded on platforms, staring at silent departure boards. The Tohoku Shinkansen halts service between Fukushima and Shin Aomori within minutes. Every train stopped for emergency inspection. On the roads, buses, and cars crawl through intersections where signals have failed. Drivers guided only by the frantic gestures of police in reflective gear. Repair crews scramble to assess damage, radios crackling with reports of downed lines and blocked roads. Dust clouds rise from hillsides as minor landslides scatter debris onto rural highways. In coastal towns, Sea walls stand against a restless sea, but the real threat is still gathering offshore. Streets once lit by neon and lanterns now flicker with the glow of emergency vehicles. Each disruption, every snapped wire, every stalled train, underscores the reach of the quake. The city's lifelines, built for resilience, are tested in real time as officials race to restore order. With infrastructure strained and the night unsettled, the community braces for what comes next. Red warning banners light up across the Pacific coast as the Japan Meteorological Agency issues a tsunami bulletin. The map is unmistakable. Bold red zones stretch along Aomori, Iwata, and Hokkaido, with forecast heights reaching up to three meters in the most exposed bays. In coastal towns, loudspeakers crackle to life, repeating urgent instructions, move to higher ground, leave the shore, do not return until authorities declare it safe. Police cars and fire trucks roll through darkened streets, their loud hailers cutting through the night. At Kuji Port in Iwate, tide gauges register a rapid surge. By 12.10 a.m., Japan's standard time, the water level jumps 50 centimeters above normal, confirming the threat is real. Similar readings come in from Urakawa, Hokkaido, just minutes later. 
The numbers may seem modest, but in harbors and river mouths, even a half-meter wave can send powerful currents sweeping through docks and low-lying streets. Cameras at the water's edge capture the first surge. Water overtops seawalls by tens of centimeters, swirling in eddies that toss small boats against their moorings. Fishermen and harbor officials, already on alert, watch as the tide runs higher and faster than the moon could ever pull. The forecast and the reality are now locked together. Officials' warnings are validated in real time. Crowds on evacuation hills check their phones for updates, watching live graphics and tide plots. Compliance grows as evidence mounts. This is not a false alarm. The precision of the Japan Meteorological Agency models, matched by the tide gauge spikes, leaves no room for doubt. Every minute, the decision to evacuate becomes more urgent and more justified. Seismograph needles leap and settle, then jump again. Within minutes of the main shock, a dense cluster of aftershocks spreads across the offshore trench. On the Japan Meteorological Agency real-time map, dozens of circles bloom northeast of Hachinohe, each one a separate jolt, most between magnitude 4 and 5, and a handful stronger. The largest early aftershock, magnitude 5.1, strikes less than 40 minutes after the main event, rattling windows and nerves in coastal Aomori. Inside the crisis management office at the Prime Minister's headquarters, monitors fill with waveforms and epicenter plots. Officials review the Omori curve, watching as the aftershock rate starts high and begins its slow decline. Japan Meteorological Agency seismologists warn that the first hour is especially hazardous. They say many aftershocks of magnitude 4 to 6 are expected in the coming hours and people must remain on alert for further shaking and possible secondary tsunami advisories. On the ground, the evacuation wave grows. Car headlights snake inland along narrow roads, brake lights glowing in long lines as families leave coastal neighborhoods. Municipal coordinators open school gymnasiums and community centers, laying out blankets and water bottles for arrivals. Emergency workers direct traffic at crowded intersections, urging people to keep moving away from the shore. In shelters, Residents check their phones for aftershock updates. Each new tremor sends a ripple of anxiety through the crowd. Loudspeakers repeat the message, do not return to low-lying areas. Remain on high ground until all warnings are lifted. The government's crisis response remains fully mobilized, with damage assessment teams, search and rescue units, and local officials working through the night. As the aftershock sequence continues, the need for vigilance and coordinated action is clear. Beneath the Pacific Ocean east of Aomori, the Pacific Plate slides relentlessly under northern Japan at nearly 8 centimeters per year. This collision zone, the Japan Trench, marks one of the world's most active subduction boundaries where immense geological stress builds over decades. When that stress finally releases, the seafloor can lurch upward in a matter of seconds, as it did tonight. A shallow thrust fault common in this region pushes water above it, sending tsunami waves racing toward shore. A Japan Meteorological Agency seismologist explains that vertical seafloor displacement from thrust faulting on the Japan Trench is how even a magnitude 7 quake can generate tsunami warnings here. The risk is ever-present. The Ring of Fire's restless plates guarantee that these offshore quakes and the sudden dangerous tsunamis they can unleash will remain a fact of life for Japan's coastal communities. On March 11, 2011, a magnitude 9.0 earthquake ruptured nearly 500 kilometers of the Japan Trench, unleashing a tsunami that swept across the Pacific and devastated entire towns. The energy released that day was about a thousand times greater than tonight's magnitude 7.6, an almost unimaginable difference in scale. On a fault map, the 2011 rupture zone stretches far to the south, dwarfing the compact patch of tonight's event off Aomori and Hokkaido. While 2011 remains the benchmark for catastrophe, even a much smaller rupture on this plate boundary can trigger dangerous local tsunamis and force urgent evacuations along the coast. From above, the scale of disruption becomes clear. Helicopter crews sweep the coastline, capturing rows of fishing boats left stranded on keys and in some cases pushed onto narrow roads by the surge. Split-screen images reveal subtle but telling changes, sections of seawall now stained and battered, with water stains marking the overtopping point. Pockets of standing water fill low-lying farmland near river mouths, where sediment-laden currents forced their way inland. 
Engineers on board scanned for cracks and breaches, noting every sign of stress along the coastal defenses. Each pass confirms the reality. Even moderate tsunami waves can breach barriers and scatter vessels far from their moorings. Japan sits on one of Earth's most volatile fault lines, where another megathrust could strike without warning. As urban coasts grow denser, every minute of preparation now decides who survives tomorrow. Nature won't wait. The question is, will we? Share your thoughts and preparedness tips in the comments below.